Okay, so let's have a look at a code example written in GNU assembly of coding on RISCOS. In this code example, we are going to um, write a small program that has an infinite loop in which we will alternate writing on the console the word tick or talk and at the same time flashing the uh, caps lock LED on the keyboard. This program shows you fundamentally how to use uh, syscalls on RISCOS in GNU assembly. Um, I already have loaded the source code in my favorite editor, which is um, StrongEd. You, because the source code is just a text file, you can use any editor out there, if you like. Um, a couple of notes before we start digging into the uh, source analysis. The first one is uh, about the coloring syntax. Uh, StrongEd doesn't actually has a syntax module for uh, GNU assembly, and therefore the coloring syntax is a bit off. He believes that the source has been written for uh, RISCOS Open Object Assembler, which has a syntax that is different from uh, GNU assembly. However, the coloring syntax is good enough for the scope of this video. Um, the second important note is that I wrote this code to be as readable as possible and for as many people as possible out there. So also people that are not familiar with um, assembly coding. By the way, if you're not familiar with the terminology that I will use in this uh, video, in the video description below, there is a link to a blog article that will give you all the uh, information about the terminology used in this video. Also, you can download this entire source code from uh, the RISCOS community on GitHub. And also in the video description below, there is a link to uh, get the source code um, so you can play with it. All right, with this out of the way, let's get into the source code. Now, the first line that we find in the source is a directive. And this directive is dot .file. Now, this directive allow us to tell to GNU Assembler that we are starting a new logic file unit. And we can specify the name of this logic file unit between double quotes. I believe you can also specify it without using the double quotes, but to be safe, I always use the double quotes. The next line is another directive, .global. This is a very important directive because it allows us to make the symbols that we define into our source code available to the GNU linker. This particular line is fundamental because it makes it available to the uh, linker, the symbol underscore start, which the linker will require in order to be able to understand how to set the entry point to our program. So we always must specify this when we are writing an application, for example. The next set of uh, directives that we find are .eq. And this directive allows us to fundamentally assign a number to a more human readable uh, string, if you want, or symbol. And I, given that GNU Assembler comes without a definition of all the syscall used by uh, uh, and used on RISCOS, I just created a bunch of them that we are going to use through this code in order to make the code more readable. So, for example, XOS byte uh, will be replaced during the uh, assembler phases uh, with this number, okay, which is the ID of the syscall plus what we call the uh, X bit set. Now we're going to have a video about the x-bit, so um, for now just know how this number actually is, is composed. Next we find a, another directive which is dot .text and what this directive tells to the GNU you know, assembler is that what follows is actually a code section. On the next line, we define the first label, which is underscore start. And as we mentioned, this will also be the entry point to our program. Next, I define another label, which is main underscore loop. This label is not really required, but I think that it will make the reading of this code much easier because it represents the uh, place where our infinite loop will begin. On the next line, we C 
see that we are trying to here to use uh, a concept that is similar to variables. Now, assembler, assembly, sorry, doesn't really do variables. So in this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to use labels that are defined into a data section of the, um, the program that is down here. All right. And these labels, for example, state, which represent the state in which we are in our program, will point to a word that we have preset, in this case, to the value 1. And this type of views kind of simulate um, integer variables in more um, high-level languages. So what we're doing here fundamentally is we are loading the address of state into CPU register R0. And then what we are going to do in the next line through indirect addressing is that we're going to load in R1 the value of state. Okay. So fundamentally, at the end of these two lines, R1 will contain the value 1 that we set state to. What we do next is we're going to use a norm pseudo instruction, which is neg. And what neg does is it multiplies by minus one the content of, in this case, register R1, and then stores the result back, in this case, into R1. So fundamentally, what we're going to do here is we multiply the value state by minus one. So at each loop iteration, basically, uh, it will become, state will become one minus one, one minus one, one minus one, okay? And then what we do here is we use the instruction str to store the value that we have in R1 back to where? Well, into state, okay? And this is how we're using literally state as a variable. So if this entire piece of code, you know, was a, I don't know, a BBC basic or in a C, then it would be something that would have looked like an integer variable called state equal minus state. OK. That's what we're doing here. Now, what we do next here is we compare, right, the value that we have in R1 with 1. OK. And then here, okay, with BQ, we basically branch if R1 is equal to 1. And where we branch, we branch into a subroutine called PTOC, that stands for print talk, which will print talk on the screen. And if R1 is not equal to 1, then we will continue to this next line, which is branch uh, basically always. And we will jump basically to a subroutine that is called ptick, which stands for print tick, which will print tick on the screen. So if R1 is equal to 1, then we will print talk on the screen. And if R1 is not equal to 1, in our case, for example, it's going to be equal to minus 1, then we will print tick. Okay. Then what happened in print talk or print tick is after they print the string on the screen, what they will do is they will jump to this label called check M loop that I've defined here. Okay. And what's going to happen here is that we will do a branch with link to a subroutine called toggle underscore CL, which stands for toggle caps lock. What toggle caps lock um, does, it's very simple. It just uh, inverts the state of the uh, keyboard caps lock LED. So if it is on, it will switch it off. And if it is off, it will switch it on. OK. And once it's done that, because it's a branch with link, he will return back here to this line. And we will do another branch with link to a subroutine called wait, which what wait does. Well, guess what? It what just wait and it will wait for roughly a second. And once the time has passed, wait will come back here. And we will do another branch with link to another subroutine called scan KBD, which stands for scan 
keyboard. Now, why do we need a subroutine that scans for uh, the keyboard? Which, by the way, this routine just scans for uh, if you're pressing any key, included the mouse buttons. Well, we need this routine because we used a trick in the wait routine. And what we do, what we do in the wait routine is we create an infinite loop. However, we also set a callback mechanism. Okay. Now, if you remember from the introductory video uh, coding on RISCOS, we said that the kernel in RISCOS is not aware of processes and is not uh, scheduling tasks and all these things. However, we can kind of simulate multitasking by using callbacks mechanism or IUQ. In this case, we're using a callback mechanism, which means that we will start in wait an infinite loop, but by setting a callback mechanism, we will ask RISCOS himself, itself, to call uh, a routine in our code and what this routine will do it will set a flag that will tell wait subroutine to quit his infinite loop and this is going to happen after a second has elapsed right so that we can simulate the wait in a very very simple way we will have a, a look at all the details when we get into the wait subroutine Anyway, once, once the second has elapsed, wait will come back here and what we're going to do is we execute scan keyboard, as we're saying. And if we are pressing a key, okay, we will quit the program. Now, the reason why we need scan keyboard is because we want to make sure, right, that the user will never try to quit this program before the callback in wait has completed. And that's a very important thing because, as we mentioned in the introduction, RISCOS is not aware, uh, aware of processes and all these things. So, if we set a callback and then, by mistake, the user quits the program before the callback has completed, then RISCOS will still try to jump at that memory location where there might not be the routine anymore, and so bad thing may happen. So, how do we prevent bad thing from happening? Well, we scan for a user. Uh, that is pressing a key after the callback has completed. So by pressing any key, you will be able to quit this program without causing any trouble to your uh, RISCOS system. And that's why we need this routine here. Anyway, so if no key has been pressed, then scan keyboard will return here. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, branch. So we're going to jump back to main loop. And as you can see here, this is how the infinite loop actually is going to work. And that is going to go on forever unless, well, you press any key or any mouse button. And that is how our program works. Next, we're going to have a look at all the detail of all the subroutines. Now, the first one we're going to have a look at is PTIC, which is pretty straightforward. What PTIC does, again, uses kind of a concept of simulating a variable. And in this case, the variable is tickmsg, and we have defined tickmsg in, again, in the data section down here. And that's what tickmsg is. And tickmsg stands for tick message. And how we define it? So tickmsg is a label that points this time to an ASCII Z, which in GNU assembly means an ASCII string null terminated. So Z stands for zero. Okay. And this string is expressed over here between double quote, and we and it's basically tick plus the uh, return symbol and the line feed symbol, which means that it will print tick on the screen and then it will return at the beginning of the next line. And because we define it as an ASCII Z, well, we know assembler will add the extra zero at the end of it. Okay, so the null character. Somebody also calls the ASCII Z string as C strings, if that's. Anyway, and for the talk message, we have done exactly the same. So here's the uh, label uh, talk MSG that points at an ASCII Z string where we basically write talk on the screen and then we have the return plus the line feed. Okay. And again, uh, GNU Assembly will add the null character at the end of the string. All right, so let's go back to our uh, two routines. So here we have an LDR that will load the address of tickmsg into CPU register R0. And that is required by the syscall that we're going to call next, which is 
uh, Ixos write zero, which is a, a, a syscall that will just write a null terminated string on the screen. And it requires that the address that points at the string to print is to be loaded in R0. So in when we use syscalls, we also call this, you know, the syscalls uh, uh, parameters. Once we, on the next line, we call the uh, SY, express by 0, which will print the string on the uh, screen. And then when we return from the SY, what we're going to do is we're going to jump to the label check and loop as up here. Okay. And we will execute what we said before. PTOC works exactly the same way. And instead of writing tick on the screen, it will load the address of talk MSG and therefore um, XOS write zero will write the message talk on the screen. And after he's done that, we will jump back to check uh, M loop. The next subroutine that we're going to have a look at is toggle CL, which stands again for toggle caps lock. Now, what we do here, well, the first thing is we push a set of reg registers that I'm going to modify on the stack. This is just my way of coding in assembly, uh, in assembly, sorry. And basically, by doing this, I save those registers so I can then recover them when I am about to return from this subroutine. This just helps me to keep the uh, CPU register state into a well-known state. Um, I believe this should work also without using push and pop, but it's better to do it for safety. What we do next is we are going to call another uh, syscall, which is uh, exhaust byte. Okay? And the way we call it is we pass as the first parameter in a CPU register R0 the value 202, which is a service offered by exhaust byte. And it's a service that allows us to do what? either to read or to write a flag set that represents the state of various uh, keys on the keyboards, which includes caps lock. And what we can do is, uh, by basically, uh, in this particular case, we, we, case, sorry, we are going to write directly because what uh, Exos by 202 allow us to do is to have an exclusive O on uh, that flag set directly. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to load in a CPU register R1 the value 16. And what 16 means, it's it's a binary number where the bit, the fifth bit or bit number four, because remember bits are counted from zero, is set to one and all the other bits are set to zero. And because 202 okay, is going to do an exclusive OR by passing this special value, what we're going to do is is only going to uh, uh, EOR, exclusive OR, the uh, fifth bit in the uh, flag set, okay, that represent the state of all these uh, keys. And therefore, and all the others are going to be preserved. And how do we do that? Well, the next parameters are, uh, we pass 255, which is a mask, into R2, which basically fundamentally means take all those bits in this flag set and we are only going to EOR bit fifth, and the others are going to be preserved. And then the final thing is we call the SWI exos byte that will execute uh, this piece of logic. So when we return from this SWI, what's going to happen is we have changed basically the logical state of caps lock, the logical state. We still have not updated the um, LED state on a keyboard. To do that, we need to call osbyte again, and this time we need to pass in CPU register R0 as parameter 118. And when we do that, okay, what it's going to do is it's going to update the state of L the LED uh, to reflect what we have set into the logical state up here. So if up here we uh, set it to 0, then here it will turn the LED off. If up here we set it to 1, then here it will turn the uh, caps lock LED on. Okay. When we return from this Y, we do uh, we uh, restore the CPU register that we saved before and the link register, and then we execute a move of link register 
into PC, which in ARM assembly fundamentally is a return instruction, which will basically help us to return up here and we will going to execute the next uh, subroutine in our list. Okay. Now, wait is a very interesting subroutine and I've tried to write it um, so that you can reuse it also in your own code. So I try to make it sure that you know it's reusable and you don't have to modify. Um, the way wait works is that it will um, set a flag okay, that then will be used by a callback mechanism to be set to the state of one, right, to tell a, an infinite loop that we have, we will set into the wait subroutine to complete. And this callback will happen after roughly a second has elapsed. Okay, so let's have a look at the details. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to reset the flag, okay, to make sure that it's always set to zero. And so to do that, we load the address of the variable timer done, which is our flag, in our zero, right? And then we set R1 to zero, and then we store the value of R1, so zero, into timer done. So if this was a piece of C code or um, BBC basic code, this would be the equivalent of using an integer variable called timer down equal to zero. Okay, that's what we do here. And we have to do this as first thing every time we call wait again. Now, timer down again is defined down here in the data section here and points to a word that is predefined as zero as well. What we do next is we will call OS call after, which is a RISCOS SWI uh, that will basically allow RISCOS to call a function that in our code that we defined, or a subroutine in this case in assembly, after a timer has elapsed. So after a certain amount of time has elapsed. Now to make this routine reusable, what we've done is we created um, here uh, the uh, value of the timer into a variable, which is defined again in the data section down here, it's here. And points to a word that is predefined with the value of 100. And that's because OS call after you 70 seconds. So to have a wait of roughly one second, we need to use the value of 100. So we load the address of timer in R1 and then we load the value of timer, okay, in direct address say, into our zero. And that's one of the requirements for OS call, which we need to pass in the CPU register R0, the timer value. Then we use the instruction ADR, okay, to load the address of the function uh, that we want RISCOS to call when the timer uh, will be elapsed. OK, and this is a label in our code that is defined down here. OK, and what this function does. OK, so when the timer has elapsed, OK, what this function does is uh, we'll simply set our flag timer down to one. That's all it does. And then it returns. Now, a few words about this function. So when RISCOS will call our wait done, it will call it in, with a CPU in uh, SVC mode, so in privileged mode, and with the IRQs disabled. So it's it's very important that when we write this type of functions, we're very careful. Now the first thing we need to do here is making sure that we're going to store all the registers right on the stack. Now, both the registers that we are going to modify directly and eventually even the registers that might be modified within our routine because we are calling other SWIs or something. We have to be extremely careful. So even if you are only modifying R0 and R1, for your convenience, I am storing them all from R0 to R12. And the link register as well. It is not really required for the specific weight done, but it's a useful 
a tip for you for the few, for, for your own um, callback routines. Then what we do here, we simply load the address of time add-on in R0, then we set R1 to 1, and then we store the value 1 basically in time add-on. So again, if this was a BBC basic um, piece of code, that would be time add-on equal to 1. What we do next is we recover from the stack all the registers that we have saved previously, because the moment we leave these routines, all the registers have to be exactly in the state that we have found them. Okay? And then we return. But where are we are returning from here? We are returning back to RISCOS. Okay, so you have to be, that's why you have to be very careful. We're not returning to our code, we're returning back to RISCOS. And then RISCOS will resume the execution of our routine. Now, we haven't started this yet, so we just defined the call to wait done. And then we can pass also a uh, value in R2 that's going to be used for um, uh, to be passed to um, wait done. In my case, I don't need it, so I'm just setting it to zero. And finally, we call um, OS call after, and OS call after will set all these things and start the counter. What we do next is we start an infinite loop here, okay? And what this loop does, all it does is basically it loads the value of time on and check if it is being set to 1. How do we do that? Again, we uh, load the address of time down in R0, and then we load indirect addressing the value pointed by R0 in R1, and then we compare R1, the value in R1, with 1. And if R1 is not equal to 1, then we will jump back to wait loop. So we create this infinite loop, okay? So what's happening here is this. We set OS call after, right? Okay, and we continue and we start our infinite loop. Our infinite loop, just check for time done. Now, RISCOS, check the timer while we're doing this infinite loop, okay? And when timer is expired, roughly a second, it will call wait done, okay? It calls wait done, our loop is still going, it calls wait done, and wait done will set the flag timer done to one, okay? And then it will return to RISCOS. Now, what happened here in our infinite loop is that that point, finally, timeadon will be equal to one. So instead of jumping back again to wait loop, what's going to happen? We will exit the infinite loop. And what we do here is we restore the register from R0 to R2, as we found them up here, and then we return from wait to our infinite main loop, okay? So that's what's happening here. We go back here, and then we will jump immediately on scan KBD. Now, what we do in scan KBD, in scan keyboard, is again, we save the registers that I'm going to modify. And then what we do next is we're going to call osbyte but this time with a service one to one which is a service that allow us to do uh, we request RISCOS basically scan for the keyboard and let me know if any key was pressed when you did the scan and we also tell it passing zero on, on, on r1 that we want it to scan for every key uh, if i remember correctly starting from the shift on the left so literally every key is that is pressed, it has to let us know. And how this is going to happen is that when SWI or SBYTE with the service one to one has completed, if there was a key pressed, then the value of that key pressed will be returned in R1 register. And if no key was pressed when RISCOS did the scan, well, then the code FF will be uh, returned in the CPU register R1. So all we need to do here is compare R1 with the value FF in hexadecimal, okay? And basically what we do here is if R1 is different than FF, so if there was a key pressed or a mouse button pressed when you checked, 
OK, then exit means that we will jump to the exit subroutine, which we have here. And what the exit subroutine does is very simple. It just set CPU register R020. That's a, a risk cost convention that if there was an error during the execution of our code, we should always exit with R0 um, pointing at an error block. In this case, we're fine. So we just set it to zero, so null. And then we call the SWI OS exit. And that will return control to risk cost and terminate our program. So if a key was pressed, jump to exit, do what I said. Otherwise, restore the registers from the stack and then return to our main infinite loop. Okay? And that's it. There you have it. Here, we will return from scan keyboard and then we will jump back to main loop and this is going to go uh, forever unless we press a key. That's pretty much it. OK, next, let's have a look at how we will assemble this code. OK. Now, to assemble code, given that normally it's required more than one operation, what I do is if I cannot use a make file, then I use a RISCOS uh, script, an OB script. They're called OB script. And I have it uh, stored here, and I usually call make GCC. And that's important because it reminds me that I'm going to use GCC to assemble um, this um, assembly uh, assembly code and that is important because in RISCOS it needs to know uh, where the um, assembler is and, and so on and so forth and to, that, to do that sorry we can uh, go to the hard drive and if you install GCC through uh, Pacman then GCC will leaves in apps development and then we just double click on GCC and that's all we have to do. And this basically sets a uh, series of um, environment variables which will allow RISCOS to find the assembler, the GCC, C compiler, C, C++ compiler, etc. and the link. So it's very important. So at this point, let's have a look at the script. Now the RISCOS OB file, if you're familiar with uh, Windows or Linux, are the equivalent, uh, if you're familiar with Windows, of the uh, PowerShell script or the um, batch script. Or if you're more familiar with Linux, they're the equivalent of bash script or ZSH script. Now, they are not, OB is not as powerful as bash, but, you know, it's the same type of creature if you want. The uh, first line is just a comment. Now, the second line here is a command that will use an environment variable, and this environment variable is special and is usually set by RISCOS filer. And this environment variable will point to this directory where our script is in, okay? So what we're telling RISCOS here is select this directory, okay? Now, if you're familiar with Windows, don't get confused because on Windows, uh, the dir command will list the content of that uh, of a directory. But on RISCOS, dir command select a directory. Okay. Then what we do next is we set an environment variable that we have called debug dollar build, and we use this environment variable to set. Uh, we set it to zero if we want a regular build, but we can set it to one if we want a debug build. Now, the difference between a regular build and a debug build, you should be familiar with that, is that the debug build will have all the extra symbols required to run our executable into a debugger and see what's going on. Um, and if we want to make a release, we don't want to have all the debug symbols because that will make our executable much larger. So in this case, what we're going to do uh, is we set the bug build to zero for release. OK, you will find all this code on the RISCOS community on GitHub in the coding on RISCOS repository. So you will be able to download all these things and play with them uh, at your own discretion. What we do next here is we execute the RISCOS command cdir 
and basically what this command doesn't discuss it will create a new directory if it does not exist already now don't get confused if you're used to linux cd on linux selects a directory on riscos it creates a directory it stands for create directory okay so if the directory and where is it going to create the directory well if you remember the introduction where we said that we use the at symbol to specify the current directory the current directory we selected it here with their command so we are going to create the o subdirectory in this directory if it does not exist if it exists it will not do anything okay now what we do next is we verify okay if there we verify if the dot o directory in the in our current selected directory contains already a file called flash caps lock now this o directory okay is, is kind of special now if you're familiar with linux or windows when you build a, an executable the first stage of the compilation or the assembly is to produce an object format an object file and normally this object file is called well in this case would be flash caps lock dot o but in the introduction video we said riscos doesn't actually have the file extension Okay, Riscos has file types. So this was an old convention made by Acon that instead of uh, uh, calling them flash caps lock dot o, we call them o dot flash caps lock, and we use a directory to store them. Okay, so that's why we create the o directory over here, and that's why we check if there is a flash caps lock, an o dot flash caps lock, basically in the current directory. And if there is, then we are going to remove it using the command wipe. And Riscos uh, file system is case insensitive. So here, basically, what I'm going to do is remove everything that is uh, a wildcard in the current directory dot o. So remove every file, basically, in this directory. And these are a set of flags that fundamentally says don't be verbose don't ask for confirmation and force the removable now why am i going to do this well because if i already have made a build and so i've changed my code or something i want to make sure that the previous object code is removed from the dot o directory okay so that's why i have this line what i do next is i check if the bug build environment variable is set to zero as it is in this case and if so what i'm going to run is the i'm going to call the assembler the gnu assembler and i will ask it to assemble my uh flashback sorry <laughs> flash caps lock source which again if you're familiar with linux a uh, an assembly source is in this case will be flash caps lock dot s but risk cost doesn't use the extension so it becomes s dot flash lock uh flash caps lock and is contained in the direct in the subdirectory s okay and we ask the assembler to produce an object file e <laughs> o dot flash caps lock if instead we have defined debug dot build equal to one okay then we are going to call the gnu assembler and again ask him to assemble uh, s dot flash caps lock and produce o dot flash caps lock but this time we pass also the flag minus g which will add uh, debug symbols okay to the assemble code then what we're going to do next is again we check if the bug build is equal to zero and if so then we call the linker the GNU assembler linker ld and we will ask it to link our o dot flash caps lock and produce an executable called flash caps lock and store it in the current directory which is this one and we're going to store it like this here okay and what we're going to do is we're going to pass extra flags that are we don't want it to be uh, linked against the standard library which is should be by default but i will specify it so make sure and then we also strip all the symbols from it and discard all the symbols from it this will make our code really, really small, which is pretty handy. So we have a, can have a look at this, which I already built. And, you know, we do count. 
and we can see that it's only 668 bytes. So it is more. If instead here we have defined debug dollar build equal to one, then what we're going to do is we're going to call the linker and we're only going to pass no stdlib. So it will leave all the symbols and plus the debug symbols. So the executable will be much larger, but we will be able to execute it through a debugger and have a source code level debugging. Okay. And then what we do at the end is we uh, unset the debug build so we don't have we don't leave it hanging in uh, the risk cost memory after we executed our field. And this is something I've just left here. Okay. So let's double click on MKGCC. And what's going to happen basically is if flash caps lock exists already, it will be removed and we will uh, build it again. X new. And if it does not exist, then we will just build it. So let's have a look. And yes, we just built. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do next, we're going to execute it. And when we execute it, you will see that it prints tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock on the screen. And if we have a look at the keyboard, we will see that the caps lock LED is flashing on and off, like we're printing tick or tock on the screen. Thank you very much for watching.